Well, good morning and welcome to Lakewood Baptist Church. We are uh, a people gathered digitally this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we're so thankful that you have decided to join us this morning as we do. A couple announcements for our folks. Remember that giving is available online at our website, lakewoodbc.org, or you can mail in your offerings to the church office so that we can count those and have them ready to go for the rest of this week. We are so grateful for your generosity and thankful for your participation with us as we continue to minister in this difficult time. Tonight, we will continue our, our new study called Together for Good. It's a study of how we can counsel ourselves and one another regarding what the scriptures say about our most common struggles, loneliness, depression, anxiety, and others. You received a Zoom link with the email that you were sent about this service, so just click that link and join us tonight at 7 o'clock. We will be releasing very soon a relaunch video to uh, explain our plans for gathering again together in this building at whatever capacity uh, we are able. We will uh, release that video soon, so be looking out for that. We're excited about what the Lord has for us in the future, and we're trying to do everything we can to do things safely, well, um, and in a way that we can gather together to worship Christ again. We turn our attention towards Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15 is our focal text this morning. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, he has, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. We read this beautiful passage from the Apostle Paul. We should use this passage to pray that God will grant us rest in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should use this passage to help us pray that God will strengthen our faith through the knowledge of the resurrected Jesus. And we use this passage to together confess that by the grace of God, we are what we are. May God use this time in His Word, this time in worship, and this time in prayer to further our hearts, devotion to Jesus, and to further our worship of our great God who sent Christ to pay for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Let me pray for us. Lord, we come to you this morning in repentance for our sins and give thanks for the blood of Christ. We repent for the things we have done that we should not have done, and we repent for the things we should have done that we failed to do. Help us, Holy Spirit, see and savor the Word of God. Help us, Holy Spirit, to see and savor Jesus Christ. Help us, Holy Spirit, to love and obey your word. Remind us this day by your word, your spirit, and your people that it is by the grace of God that we are what we are. Disciples of Jesus Christ, forgiven sinners who are still learning repentance and faith, may you continue to teach us by your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Well, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3. 1 Peter, chapter 3. <coughs> Excuse me. While you're turning there, let me say uh, thank you to all of you at Lakewood who have cared so faithfully and kindly for me and my family, um, for uh, Jennifer and our children, and for Becky and Happy and their kids, um, and their kids' kids, uh, for all of us so well um, during this time as we've walked through the death of our mom. Um, please continue to pray for our dad who's watching this right now. So, uh, good morning, Dad. Love you. Miss you. Um, and uh, all these people in our church are praying for you right now. Um, and so, take heart. Uh, you're not alone. And we love you. So, uh, continue to pray for him as um, he adjusts to this uh, new, uh, very different, uh, and still painful normal. Our text this morning is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. One of the most obscure and difficult passages in Scripture. And so, um, as an expository preacher, you have to cover it. Um, and so, we have to just deal with what this text is saying, and we're going to do our best here this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word and we pray for us. Father, we come to you and thank you for your word. Thank you for this time we can spend together studying it. I pray that you will illumine our minds and hearts, help us to trust you and trust your word and to see the truth contained in its pages not only with eyes that are appreciative and understanding but with hearts that are filled with affection for Christ and with feet that are swift to obey I pray these things in Jesus name Amen I was talking with a famous author and counselor about personality and how we all process change and how we all process hardship and suffering. She said something striking. She said, I can handle just about anything if I know about it ahead of time. The idea was that changes and hardships in life are more easily endured when a little advanced notice is given. It gives one time to prepare and preparedness matters. This idea should be familiar to us all but particularly when thinking about suffering for doing good, that preparedness matters. Many of us, I believe, are unprepared to suffer for doing good, not because Scripture hasn't warned us, but because we've ignored Scripture's warning in favor of our own delusions. We think people suffer because they're dumb. If people were just a little bit smarter, things wouldn't go badly for them. Or people suffer because they're weak. If they were stronger, um, they wouldn't suffer as much. People suffer because they're lazy. Well, they probably had that coming because they didn't do enough. They didn't work hard enough. They didn't climb enough ladders, gain enough respect, check enough boxes. They're probably lazy. That's probably why suffering came to them. People maybe suffer because they're not Americans. Because we're Americans, we, we, we don't have to suffer and we never should. People suffer because they aren't maybe as politically savvy as we are. Well, we really know how to carry ourselves in a political environment, in a political uh, season, and so we know how to get people in politics working for us so that we don't ever have to feel any pain. People may suffer because they aren't as blessed by God. This is the holy approach to this. Well, the Lord's just blessed me. He's just, so I mean, I, I don't know why all these other people are suffering. Maybe it's because the Lord doesn't, doesn't what? Doesn't love them as much? That has chosen not to bless them as much as you. 
Um, you really think the testimony of Scripture would lend support to that? Or, and this is the worst one, people suffer because they're sinners being punished by God for some infraction. See Job's friends. All of Job's friends, except for the young guy at the end that puts a smack down on all of Job's other friends. But what did the main group of his friends say throughout that whole book? Seriously, man, just tell us what you did. Because God doesn't bring this kind of calamity on to just anybody. You had to have messed up really bad to have this happen to you. And so we still hold those views, incorrect and inaccurate though they are, about suffering because even though Scripture has given us ample testimony that suffering is normal in the life of the people of God and that every suffering that comes to us comes through the hands of a sovereign God, when we suffer for doing good, we stamp our feet in anger because we don't believe that that should happen to us. So we, we, we come at it unprepared. But what does God say about suffering for doing good? God in His Word says that suffering for doing good is not only normal, but it's what happened to Jesus. And if we follow Jesus, we should expect to get what our Master got, which is pain for doing the will of God on the earth. That's what we should expect to have happen to us. Jesus suffered for doing good, and the church should be prepared to follow Jesus into suffering for doing good. Now, Simon Peter gives us four ways to prepare to follow Jesus into suffering for doing good. He gives us four ways to prepare to follow Christ into suffering for doing good. Number one, he says, remember the cross. Remember the cross. Jesus suffered while bringing us to God. Verse 17, we'll go into the context of this passage a little bit. When Simon Peter says, It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For, now that transition word in verse 18 is significant, because he's dragging all the context of 13 through 17 into 18 through 22. And all of this talk about it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. It's better to suffer for doing good like Jesus. Jesus suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. The word that is a purpose statement in order that so that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So when we, when we look at this text, Peter is reminding us to remember the cross. The, the ultimate suffering for doing good came upon Jesus Christ for being sinless and perfect and yet suffering for those of us who are sinful and imperfect. Now, this emphasis on the suffering of Jesus is weird considering the author, don't you think? Do you remember who wrote this book? You can look down. Peter, right? So, it, Simon Peter wrote this. Do you remember what happened when Jesus told Simon Peter that he was going to go into Jerusalem and suffer? What did Simon Peter say? Oh, no, you're not. That's not going to happen to you. Far be it from you, Lord. One commentator says, The emphasis on Christ's suffering in this letter is remarkable when its source is considered. For Peter the disciple has previously so adamantly rejected any thought of a suffering Messiah when Jesus announced what lay ahead. You may have to remember, Simon Peter wrote this, and he's saying, we suffer because that's what our Lord did. And yet he was the one who was telling his Lord, no, you're not. So we have to remember, if, if it's this prominent for a man who thought that a suffering Messiah shouldn't be, it's a big deal. You have to remember the author. You also have to remember Jesus himself, what he said about suffering. It's a very interesting thing in Mark 8 that Jesus says to all of his disciples, if anyone would come after me, would follow me, let him deny himself and take up his, take up his cross, take up his instrument of death and follow me. The master suffered for doing good and anticipated doing so and he called everyone who followed after him to grab their torture stake and follow him. That's what that looks like to follow Jesus. He built it into the contract. It's built into what it looks like to follow Him. To remember what Jesus even said about suffering. But we also have to remember the cross itself. Look at what Peter says here in verse 18. Jesus died once. He died once for all, Hebrews 10.10. 10. 
one final acceptable sacrifice. Jesus died once, and he died for sins. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is in Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. What does that mean? Jesus absorbed the wrath of God on the cross for your sin and for my sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus died for sins. Jesus, the just, died for the unjust. That is a substitutionary propitiation. He substituted himself for us. We deserve to die for the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. But Jesus substituted himself for us and he bore the wrath of God that we deserve. Jesus died once for sins, the just for the unjust. And he died and suffered and bore the wrath of God in order to bring us to God. That's the purpose, to bring us to God. Colossians 1.22, He is now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him, before God. Jesus bore our punishment, bore the wrath of God, substituted Himself for us in this perfect substitutionary atonement on our behalf. To bring us to God. The, the worst evil done on the planet earth ever is the crucifixion of the Son of God. And yet he went through that suffering for the ultimate good of your salvation and mine. Jesus suffered while bringing us to God. His suffering makes our suffering endurable. Why? Because no matter how we suffer, neither life, nor death, nor angels, or rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We belong to God now because Jesus suffered to bring us to Him. And now we belong to God. So whatever suffering happens, we're following our Master who has secured a place in heaven for us. So whatever suffering happens... We are anchored to God in Christ. Not only remember the cross, though, he tells us also to remember the ark, which is super weird. Gotta say it's super weird, and when we get to heaven, I'm gonna, if, if there's a text around there, I want to take it to Simon Peter and go, really, dude? Really? Did you just do this so that seminary uh, professors and scholars and academics would write volumes on this. You just do this to mess up everything. But I think that the direction he's going here is actually very helpful for his reader if you understand what he's trying to say. Listen to what he says here, that we should remember the ark. So remember the cross and remember the ark. Verse 19, he says, in which, so Christ uh, was uh, came to life again in the spirit so it says in verse 18, made alive in the Spirit. In the Spirit, in that same way in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So many views on this passage. So many views on what this means. Martin Luther, about this passage, said, This is a strange text. And certainly a more obscure passage than any other passage in the New Testament. I still do not know for sure what the apostle meant. So, if Martin Luther is looking at this text of Scripture and goes, Super weird, Simon Peter. Super weird. Well, I, I feel like we're all in good company if we have trouble with this. But there are three primary views about this text that I want to kind of go over very quickly before I give you my view that I hold to very loosely. And I'm willing to be convinced of a different view, but I think this is the right reading of the text. So view number one, between his death and resurrection, Jesus went to paradise. You know, remember he's on the cross with the thief and he, the guy says, remember me when you come into my kingdom, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. That is, uh, there are a lot of scholars who believe that there was like an Old Testament saints holding tank for all the Old Testament saints called paradise. And where Old Testament saints are held there. And Jesus went between his death and his resurrection and preached the gospel to them. And he gave, uh, and there are two different camps on this too. When he was in paradise, he either preached just to Old Testament saints or to all Old Testament people. 
and gave them all a second chance to believe in Jesus. Uh, this view is made popular by um, this view and the next view are both made possible by are made popular by the Apostles' Creed, where he descended into hell. They say. So there's that one view where he goes to paradise and he gives Old Testament saints a chance to believe in the gospel. Number two, the other view, another view is that Jesus went to preach to demonic spirits to proclaim victory over them because of their possession of the sons of men in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. You remember there, there when uh, angels, fallen angels, marry human women, and then, um, then after that comes the flood to... Um, judge the earth and after this cosmic event here um, some authors believe this is Jesus's kind of ultimate everything after everything in that whole encounter when you tried to disrupt the human race was still all leading to me in the gospel and you are forever defeated and so one commentator says this is the ultimate cosmic in your face <laughs> which I think is interesting and I love that but I don't necessarily Hold that view, though this view is held by some of my favorite commentators. This is not my view. The last view, and this is my view, is that Jesus proclaimed redemption in the Spirit. So if you look in verse 19, this Spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. So this is a, it's looking back at what happened in the life of Noah, that Jesus proclaimed redemption in the Spirit through Noah in his own day before the flood. And so he, in the, in the 120 years before the, the flood came, uh, there's this opportunity for people to repent. And Noah is preaching and explaining what's getting ready to go on. Um, and no one is listening. And so in this moment, this is the ultimate uh, reminder of of suffering while doing good. Like ultimately what Noah is constructing here is this place of salvation, this place of refuge, this place where there is only hope inside this boat. And he's enduring suffering while he's proclaiming the only place of hope. And I think what Simon Peter is doing here is he's pointing his readers back to Noah saying, this is just like what happened in the days of Noah. And these connections are all over the Gospels where Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be. It's this kind of connection where, where there is suffering for doing good and the entire culture around you looks at the thing that you're doing and goes, yeah, but that's ridiculous. And yet it's their only hope. And so I think there's a connection there that seems to fit this context. I think he's pointing back to that. If you see it there in verse 20, they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So there's some things we have to look at in these views of this. In, in the reality of this passage, whatever view you take on this, the point that any of those views will hold out for us is what seems like God's lack of attention to your suffering is really God's patience until judgment arrives. What seems like God's lack of attention to a situation may just be his patience that's meant to lead people to repentance. And that comes from Romans 2, 4, we know, right? For it is the kindness of our Lord that is meant to lead you to repentance. So all this time that they have to watch Noah building this boat, it's the kindness of the Lord, the kindness of the Lord, every, every pounding of the hammer, every picking up of a board, every animal that walks up the ramp into the ark is another moment of God's kindness that humanity rejects with clenched fist. Now we also have to see that there's a remnant here. Only eight persons were brought safely through the water. Now the water is a symbol of God's judgment in the times of Noah and in the times of Jonah, which is why Jesus says things like, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, or belly of the fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth. It's, it's, a, it's a, a sign of God's of judgment and death. And the way has always been narrow. The way has always been narrow. Salvation has always come through judgment. Mercy has always triumphed. 
But that mercy has triumphed for a remnant, for a small group of people. Thus, the people in Peter's audience should not be shocked when people marginalize and mock them for their belief in God. Because to the culture around them and to the culture around us, we look like people who are building a giant boat the size of our neighborhood when we say things like, well, I'm trusting in a Jewish carpenter who walked out of a tomb 2,000 years ago to save my soul from hell. We, we look like obscure, backwoods idiots. And we're going to be made fun of, we're going to be mocked, we're going to be marginalized for that kind of belief. What Peter is saying is, look in Scripture. The, the same reality of salvation that Christ preached, the same triumph of the grace of the gospel that Christ preached, is the same gospel that's been preached all the way throughout the entirety of Scripture, and it has always been rejected except by the people of God. People had 120 years to believe in Noah's God, and no one did. And yet salvation still came to those eight people. Remember the ark. Remember the ark. This is the way it's always been. So what's, what's Peter ultimately saying? This is not new. All the people of God throughout all the history and scripture have always had to deal with this kind of reaction to the truth that they believe. Remember the ark. So remember the cross. Remember the ark. Remember your baptism. Chapter 3, verse 21. Chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism, he says, which corresponds to this, this what? Being brought to safety through water. Mm. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation still comes through judgment. This line from a commentator is helpful. Peter's readers will be among those who escape the second flood of judgment because they have already passed through the waters of Christian baptism, which saves them by the virtue of the vindicating resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see this? There's another flood coming. There is another judgment coming. But the Lord will not destroy the earth by water this time. The rainbow in the sky reminds us that that's not how it's going to go this time. But judgment next time is going to be far worse and far more intense. And yet you have already walked through the waters of judgment. Why? For you were buried with Christ in baptism, and you have been raised to walk in what? In newness of life. Baptism is an outward reflection of an inward change and a desire for cleansing in Christ. You're buried with Christ in baptism and you are raised to walk in newness of life. You're a new creation from the inside out. We died with Him and now we live with Him. Salvation has come through judgment again. But we're identifying with the judgment of Jesus on the cross and His resurrection as we rise from the dead and walk in newness of life. Peter is encouraging his readers here, no matter how painful your suffering may be, remember your baptism. You've already passed through the waters of judgment. What more can happen to you? You've already risen from death and you walk in newness of life. All they can do is kill you and send you to Jesus. So remember your baptism. And then lastly, remember the king. Remember the king. Verse 22. The resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Jesus reigns over the universe. That's your last way to prepare for suffering. Jesus reigns over the universe. So look at the position of Christ in verse 22. It's a position of victory. He is in heaven. He has finished his course. It's a position of authority. He is at the right hand of God. The position of authority and power and dominion. He is over all. That's the third thing. Supremacy. He's over angels, authorities, and powers. So you remember the cross, remember the ark, remember your baptism, and then remember the king. Remember the reigning king of kings and lord of lords. Suffering looks different when it's seen through the lenses of the reigning Christ. All things are under his dominion and control. All things. All things. Pandemics. Politics, they're very similar. 
pandemics and politics, both kind of like diseases that infect everything. He's sovereign over all of it. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord and he will direct it wherever he wants. He's, he reigns over the universe. So no matter, no matter how the suffering may roll upon us, Christ reigns over every little tiny moment. So in these four areas of remembrance, how can we prepare one another using the scriptures to suffer for doing good? How can we use this text in our church to encourage each other, to speak to one another? Well, there are three things I want to use to apply this text. Conviction, first of all. What truth has this passage taught us? Then I, I, I want to look at the gospel. How has the gospel of Jesus Christ changed us as seen in this text? And then we want to talk about our ability to speak the word of God prayerfully into the lives of each other. How can we encourage each other with these things? So number one, what, is, what truth has this text taught us? That Jesus suffered while bringing us to God and his people should be prepared to follow him. We should be prepared to follow him. We follow a, a savior who came to earth as a man and died on the cross for our sins. We follow a master who told us, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. So Hebrews 13 reminds us, Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Listen to this. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. You see the command? Let's go out and suffer with Jesus. Why? For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. This is not our home. We don't belong here. We are aliens and strangers. We are hopeful exiles. So let's go to him and bear the reproach he endured because we have no lasting city here. Everything that we're clinging to is all going to burn. Let's go to Christ, the Christ who suffered to bring us to God. Let's follow him. Be prepared to follow him. Number two, how has the gospel of Christ changed us into, into the kind of people who can do this? Because do you like suffering? I do not. I do not like it. I don't like suffering. I don't, I don't like little suffering. I don't like going to the dentist. So this kind of idea of suffering for Christ is a frightening one, I think. I think to all of us it can be a frightening thing. How has the gospel of Jesus Christ turned us into a kind of people who can do this? You have to recognize the identity that has been sculpted out for you in this passage. You have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Once for all, the just for the unjust. He made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. We have been reconciled to God. We have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We belong to God now. And our baptism is a reflection of all that has happened to us. We have passed out of death into life. We walked out of the tomb following the Jewish carpenter who walked out 2,000 years ago. After he walked out of the tomb, all of the church followed in step after him. We belong to God. We've been united to God, and we are headed to God, where we will see our sovereign reigning Lord at the right hand of the Father reigning over the universe. The gospel of Jesus Christ has recreated our identity. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old has passed away, and everything has become new. Jesus has made us into the kind of people who can suffer well. And this passage is the kind of thing that prepares us to do it. So then how can we prayerfully speak the word of God into each other's lives? Really fast. Three ways that we can help each other. I think we can help each other by saying things like, don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget the one who has gone into heaven is seated at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Don't forget. Jesus reigns. Jesus reigns. Don't forget. Don't forget. Jesus is on his throne. 
Everything that comes to you comes through a sovereign hand. Don't forget. Secondly, I think we can remind each other, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening, happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Don't be surprised. The more you look like Jesus, the more the culture around you is going to dislike that reality. Don't be surprised. We were told a long time ago this is how it was going to be. Ask Noah. All of biblical history teaches us this same message. If we ignore this message, if we ignore this call to prepare to suffer, it won't be because we've never heard. It'll be because we just didn't want to hear it. That this can't happen to me. But don't be surprised when it does. And then lastly, do good. Sound weird? Do good. Don't forget. Don't forget what the Lord is doing in heaven as He reigns over the universe. Don't be surprised. And then do good. Do good things. Honor God. Honor God with your life in every area. And then do things that are just normal, good things to do. Plant a garden. Throw the baseball in the backyard with your kids. That last one's especially fun. But... Do those. Just live your life as a person who is unafraid. Unafraid of what is coming at you. Do good things. Work on your kids' spelling homework with them. Play a board game. Eat a good meal. Laugh. That last one is also especially fun. You know, when we were in St. Louis, as my mom was... Uh, in the process of going to be with Jesus, I had a weird, paradoxical feeling. Because I love being around my family. But I hated that moment. And I told Jennifer, so you know what's weird? I hate this moment, but I love these people. Like, we were able, in the midst of a very difficult moment, to still find a way to enjoy all the memories that we had of mom and to laugh until my jaws hurt. It's a good thing. In the midst of a horrible reality, there is still good. In the midst of suffering that may be coming for us, there is still good. What, is, what does Paul tell us in the same chapter I read to start this whole service? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, Immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Be prepared. Be prepared to suffer. To suffer well. And don't forget, in, in every moment Christ reigns. He reigns. And our work for Christ, even in suffering, is never in vain. There's hope for us. Our hopeful exiles. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us that there is hope for us in Christ. Because of all that Christ has done, because of all that Christ has accomplished on the cross, we are new. Our lives are new. Our destination is new. And as we endure suffering, Remind us, Lord, that, that is not new. That suffering has been a part of the lives of the people of God all throughout Scripture, and it will be a part of the lives of the people of God until you return. And we say together, come quickly, Lord. We're ready for you to return. We're ready for you to reign in a way that we can see. Lord, we don't have to see you reigning to know that you are because your word says so. And it anchors our souls down to a hopeful inheritance, undefiled, imperishable, unfading, that's kept for us. 
We rejoice together, no matter what comes. In Jesus' name, amen. suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. We agree with Simon Peter and with Jesus Christ and the saints throughout all the ages and say, Amen. Amen.